<laughs> Good morning, everybody. And uh, hey, thanks for making it out at uh, zero dark 30 Indianapolis time to uh, come here a point of view on, uh, on this idea that we loosely called shelf care. And uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, try to sort of walk through, in essence, how self care is changing the shelf. Um, and we're going to tackle that in a few ways as we uh, kind of look at this. And I kind of broke it down, as any of you have ever seen me do, I have a tendency to focus on little words and stuff. So we kind of broke this down into the component parts. So we're going to tackle this in four bits, the first of which is um, let's talk a little bit about self. Like, who's, uh, who are the people that are caring for themselves? How are they changing? Because I think a lot of what we're seeing in the, in the self-care industry is deeply reflective of some broader consumer trends uh, that we think are useful to understand. The second part we're going to talk about is care, kind of what they're doing. The third piece, we're going to take a little bit of a time, uh, a little bit of a window. There's about 14 other presentations today on cannabis and CBD, so I'm not going to do a deep dive into that here, uh, assuming that for those of you that want your dose of cannabis, you'll find it, uh, so hopefully legally, um, somewhere, somewhere throughout the course of the session. I do want to talk a little bit about, just at a high level, how we see that kind of... Uh, impacting and shifting not just the consumer side, but also the shelf side. There has probably not been, since the organic movement really started about 15 or 20 years ago, an opportunity to reset the economics of a category through a therapeutic concept um, or through a, through a broad multi-category concept uh, the way that CBD presents the opportunity today in, uh, in, in the categories it's going to touch. And then the last piece, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we see some of the executions, both in the physical shelf and the digital shelf. So that's our rough roadmap for the day. So when you look at the slide that never builds properly, um, you, can, uh, you can see just at a, a top level, these are some of the biggest consumer trends that we look at when we're trying to understand how retail is changing. And at 8 a.m., I always like to give you kind of a useful heuristic to think through the day. Um, these five things are, we think, going to fuel an enormous part of the conversation that you're going to see throughout the course of the day on a number of topics. Um, look, digitization and all that, um, in the end, it's really important to remember that what digitization is today is mobilization. About 60% of American Internet time is spent on a mobile phone. Um, over, about 80% of that is spent in an app. About a quarter of that, by the way, is spent in an app owned by Facebook. So, so if you want to start to think about where mobile goes and how, how all that goes, oftentimes people will ask for long, complicated, multi-million dollar proposals on their digital marketing strategy, which I'm happy to give them because that's fun for me. Um, but, uh, but in real life, um, just learning the spaces where people actually are in digital is often so much more important than putting tons of time and energy into your own proprietary assets. Be good where people are. Be, really own that conversation. Urbanization, um, a topic I won't get into too much today, but just useful to remember that if you take the six biggest cities in the country, most densely populated cities in the country, added them, added them together. So New York, Chicago, LA, San Fran, Miami, and Boston. Those six cities are a four and a half trillion dollar economy. It would, be the, it would be the fourth largest economy in the world. Just those six cities. Now here's a great question, which no one will have their hands up to, Jill, unlike the other two. What's your market share in those six cities put together? What's your market share in any one of those six cities to any degree of precision? Nobody knows. The urban U.S. is such a massive, unexplored, informal, weird retail opportunity, and it's massive. So trying to solve for some of that. Age polarization. Um, at 8.08, you've now heard the millennials are really important comment that you'll hear throughout the course of the day. So, uh, so we always like to make the millennials feel important, otherwise they get upset. Um, so, um, so, hi, Casey. And, um, so, um, <laughs> and, um, but, the, um, but the key thing is that it's also important to remember the flip side of that. Over 100% of the population growth in the United States between now and 2025 is going to come from people over the age of 65. There will be 10 million more people in the U.S., but between now and 2026, I think it is, there will be 12 million more people over the age of 65. Understanding how to manage that side of self-care, which is not just a question of how older people care for themselves, but how Gen X people care for their older parents, and the self-care that's involved in that will be a big piece of this. Income polarization I'm going to chat about in a second. Ethnic diversity, just the simple heuristic look. Uh, if you're my age or older, I'm 52. I'm 52. 78% of your peer group is, uh, is Caucasian in the United States, and 22% is non-Caucasian. For under 30 America, it's a 52-48 split. So you are, in essence, living in two fundamentally different countries from an ethnic construction point of view. Old America and young America are really different places. So that as marketers and sellers and brands, I've got to think about how I live in those two countries comfortably, particularly if my brand promise is aimed at people under 30. If I don't have a brand promise, which is inherently multicultural at its core, I'm just not going to make any sense in a world that's a 52-48 Caucasian, non-Caucasian split. Um, 
from an income point of view, um, I do want us to think a little bit about this, and this is part of a much longer piece of work that we do around trying to understand what might happen if the economy slows down. But just to think about consumers and how they're going to, quote, trade down in terms of where they actually sit today from an income point of view. So this split around that the, the most boring consumer segmentation ever created, because it's based on financial statements, um, is uh, just trying to understand consumer behavior in terms of the financial statement that reflects them best, whether it's the cash flow statement, the income statement, or the balance sheet. Cash flow statement consumers living literally from pay event to pay event, from bundle of cash to bundle of cash. These are people that are living on government checks. These are people that are getting paid in cash for jobs and don't know when they're getting paid again. The money they have in their wallet is literally all they have. 26% of American households fall into that pure cash flow statement distinction. It's a $1.8 trillion marketplace, which is, from a consumer perspective, roughly the size of India. So, um, so a massively underleveraged opportunity. Income statement shoppers managing to a budget have a little bit of flex. 40% of American households, about $4 trillion in spending power. And then the balance sheet consumers who d d define their sense of well-being based on wealth, not on income, about $5 trillion, about 34% of households. Just remember one thing, that if the economy does turn or slow down, these segments will respond very differently. So when someone says consumers are going to trade down in a slowdown, that trade down phenomenon is going to mean very different things to very different people. Interestingly today, when you think about the world of naturals and organics, and people always assume that it's a high-income phenomenon, but what this chart will show you is that the percentage of shoppers spending more on these types of product by income under 60000 a year and over is pretty consistent. So for fresh foods, only a little bit more. You know, organic shelf-stable foods, minimally processed foods, foods made with plant-based plant proteins. The same thing true across the HBC universe as well. What you are finding is, is that the want and need for organic and natural products is not income specific. Only the ability to deliver natural and organic products is historically been income specific. The more you can start to create value propositions aimed at a shopper that doesn't have as much money to spend on natural and organics, but who wants that, who wants that solution just as badly, the better off you're going to be. And this you can see when you look just as an example at DG in terms of how Dollar General's been reconfiguring their shelf sets. So whether it's health my way, nutrition my way, really leaning in on trying to take self-care and turn it into shelf care by really reconfiguring how the shelf works from a, uh, you know, from a, health, from a, healthy, from a healthy living sort of point of view. Um, the other trend that you see in this when you start to think about aging is, uh, is, a, uh, is my favorite mommy blog of all times, and some of you have seen this before, but uh, Sarah R. has been quoted by me more times than I care to think about. As a 41-year-old mother of a two-year-old, uh, I, I love my daughter beyond life myself, I just never thought I'd be this damn old with a two-year-old. Um, so this one sentence conceals probably the single most underrated universal truth in American consumer economics, which is that the average age of motherhood is going way up. You know, by 2021, the median age of a first-time mother in the United States will be over the age of 30. So what does that mean? It means a lot of things. Number one, it means you've got a lot of 41-year-olds chasing toddlers who are exhausted. And this basic need state of someone, and when you look at the, uh, think moms that are having their first kid for the first time at the age of 35 or older. Uh, one in 10 of those moms have a, it's about 10% of all births in the U.S. 25% um, of those moms have a postgraduate degree. Median household income of that segment is $100,000. It's one of the most attractive audiences in the world. How many brands are aimed at 38-year-old career professional women with a two-year-old kid? Answer, almost all of the great D to C brands that are growing up as sort of a high-end premium solution in a category are all aimed exactly at that audience, right? Um, what's not aimed at that audience? Most of the major brands and most of the big brands in the world that are trying to sell to mom as every person. So I just think this is a really interesting truth. The other thing about that one is that the key reason why we see things like naturals and organics having the shelf life that they have today is that an older mom, instead of having been an adult for two years, having kids and then doing exactly what her mom did, a 32-year-old that's having a kid's been an adult for a while. They've been adulting, to use the word that Casey taught me. Um, so, uh, so they've been adulting for many years, right? They're going to bring the sensibilities they've developed as adults to their kids. And that, to me, is the single biggest shift between organics and naturals as a fad and organics and, and a fad as a quote-unquote sustainable consumer proposition is that older moms are, have learned this as adults and are bringing this to their children. And that's one of the reasons why we see such powerful, sustainable growth in this space. 
So from a care point of view, what are they doing? I should have asked this question, but I'm a little short on time. Uh, I don't know how short on time because the timer's not going, so this is all, this is all somebody's fault, not mine, when this goes long. Um, so, uh, so um, but hey, no worries. Um, so no, don't do it. I was, uh, it was a perfectly good excuse. Um, so, uh, so anyway, but if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the size of what we call the self-care economy, uh, loosely speaking, it is a $4 trillion marketplace. Um, there aren't that many $4 trillion marketplaces in the world, so it's just good to kind of uh, focus in on that. About 25% of that is personal care, but you've got healthy eating. Wellness tourism, which is a $600 billion industry. Um, fitness, mind and body, another $600 billion industry. Preventative and personalized medicine uh, and the public health component of self-care, about $600 billion, and 360 in sort of more traditional and complementary alternative therapies. You're looking at a $4 trillion market space here. So, and when you try to understand why so much time and energy is moving into the space, this is probably a pretty good explanation as to what's happening. Um, the interesting thing is, is that today, when we look at consumers versus a year ago, they are really concerned with health and wellness, but less concerned with health specifically. And I think this is a really good indication of the expansion of this proposition into something that is a little bit more, excuse me, holistic and a little bit uh, less concerned about health care per se. I think a lot of the concern around healthcare was the noise in the news around what was happening to the American healthcare system. That seems to have died down because nothing is happening to the American healthcare system because nothing is happening in America. Um, a different topic for a different super session. But, uh, but just in general, what you've got here is that people, the types of New Year's resolutions that were made among primary household shoppers, 80% of shoppers that made resolutions made a health and wellness centric resolution by a mile, the single largest source. So you know that people want to be better. You just know that they can't always get there. This sort of manifests itself in a bunch of different ways. And uh, Dave, you and I were chatting about this this morning, right? So um, you know, just over the last couple of weeks, the number of retailers that have really started to make a statement in the, uh, you know, in the healthcare space, and one surprising one is Best Buy, who went out, who's announced that they're going to be, or actually I think they did hire a chief medical officer who's now going to be uh, running Best Buy. And then Best Buy, about four months ago, very quietly bought this company called Great Call, um, which makes all these sorts of uh, technologies for, in essence, connecting older shoppers to the tech and to the healthcare ecosystem. So really simple, sort of scaled down, um, you know, the lively wearable, an urgent response device that resp works with your smartphone, so it looks like an Apple Watch, but it's basically like the, uh, you know, the uh, iPhone and I can't get up thing. Uh, you've got, your, you've got a, a mobile medical device, you've got flip phones that are easy to use and see, all of this is now Best Buy trying to take a real stand here and figure out what their role is going to be in this new self-care ecosystem. So as you start to think about this, self-care isn't just about the health and beauty categories. Literally any category can have a self-care component to it. And if I'm going to be a meaningful player in self-care, given some of the consumer trends that we looked at earlier, I may need to play in different spaces than I've used to in the past. So um, the other one, this is one of my favorite trends in the world. Uh, guys in your healthcare in Pennsylvania piloted this a couple of years ago, where instead of giving diabetics medicine, they gave them vegetables um, and literally started running a prescription produce program for high A1C individuals in some really poor towns in Pennsylvania because they quickly diagnosed that the reason people were getting diabetes is they're eating terribly. And they're eating terribly because they didn't perceive they had the economic well-being to be able to eat well. So what they did is prescribe them $1,500 a year worth of produce. You've started to see this manifest itself in a bunch of different ways. Giant Eagle's now begun to run this, having watched guys introduce this in Pennsylvania. And you've got a business here called Wholesome Wave that's basically sort of acting as the back end for prescription-based produce. So the overlap now between healthcare and food becomes really powerful as you start to... Uh, and this stuff, by the way, guys have just done the research on this. This stuff really works. And uh, it's much easier to get the consumer to eat lettuce than it is to remind them to take expensive medication every day. So the uptake and the, uh, the therapeutic outcomes here have been really good. Um, so when you start to broaden this definition of value, the one thing you are starting to see, and, and look, this stuff always does reasonably well when the economy's going well, and that's fine, but you, know, you start to see real attitude towards value shifting. You know, an uptick in value is about what you get, not what you pay. 71% of shoppers will tell you that that's how they define value today, not as price-based. 56% willing to spend a little bit more for a product that reflects my values. And I think the answer in there is a little bit more, right? How do we deliver a proposition that delivers something beyond the basics, but in a way that isn't so expensive that it discourages shoppers? 
Um, shameless plug, but next uh, um, later this month, you're going to read uh, the fourth version of the, uh, the New Naturals Roundtable conversation that I, I hosted in partnership with Chain Drug Review. And a lot of the conversation at that roundtable was about how do you construct and enable consumers to get into the naturals and the self-care category? What are the access points so that they get over the fear of spending? That's one of the real barriers to conversion early in the category. Our third component piece here, we'll take a little bit of a look at the, the emerging trends in cat of commerce, um, so, uh, which sounds like some sort of special report on a uh, on a CNN headline news at 1.30 in the morning. So, uh, But anyway, um, you start to see where, uh, where this all lives is at the uh, intersection of uh, sick and self-care. Uh, we've done some pretty interesting work with the Canadian outfit Leafly uh, to try to profile the cannabis consumer a little bit, and uh, you know, particularly in North America, a little bit of Canada, a little bit of the U.S., just to try to get some sort of directional feel for where the CBD space could unfold. Now, obviously, these are two slightly different questions, uh, but uh, it's just interesting to look at how these consumers look at this. So top five reasons for cannabis use in the U.S. Relax and unwind is number one, but acute need is number two. And I think this back and forth that you've seen in cannabis, I think will be consistent with the back and forth that you see in CBD. It's a combination of people that want to do something that's a little different or fun, or who need to do something because cannabis or CBD solves a problem they can't solve otherwise. You know, so if you look at Charlotte's Web, which is you know, one of the largest CBD brands in the country, and look at its heritage, Charlotte's Web didn't start as a, well, it started out of Stanley Brothers, which is a recreational uh, THC company, spun off on its own. Charlotte's Web is an epilepsy solution. You know, Charlotte's a real girl. She's, a, you know, she's the daughter of somebody, and she was given the therapeutic care, and the only thing that worked to reduce her seizures was the CBD remedy that turned into the Charlotte's Web product platform. So you're going to start to see an enormous amount of back and forth here between want to have care and need to have can't fix the problem any other way care. That will be one of the many ways, I think, in which you'll be able to segment the CBD space uh, in a pretty powerful way. At the same time, your retail experiences remain highly varied. Uh, Kim, sorry, I couldn't get the photo of our gas station in New Jersey that's cornered the market on CBD and uh, on Route 46. But um, but um, but you've got uh, you've got the high end uh, you got the high end Barney's presentation for CBD. You've got something which either looks like an apothecary or a church. Um, so um, you've got your classic sort of uh, sort of uber trendy spa type environment, and then Shotgun Willie's smoking gun late night dispensary, right? So you're going to see this category come to life in a whole host of ways, right? Um, and in a whole host of need states. I really do think that it's going to be incumbent, especially for the retailers that are in the room here, the category architecture choices you make are going to be unbelievably important for how the consumer navigates their way through this category, right? So how do we design this? How do we build this? How do we architect at the shelf the right care solution to be able to really promise shelf care in a way that helps cut through all the clutter. Because if you're a consumer today and this is the retail stimulus you're getting, it's not terribly surprising that the consumers are a tiny bit confused about what the end game solution is going to look like here. So bringing clarity to this and bringing, you know, through, you know, through the power, it's like, a, it's, like, it's like an Avengers movie, but with category decision trees instead of stones. Um, but through the, through, the, through the magic power of analysis and analytics and a category tree, you can start to help the, the consumer really start to understand the category a little bit more clearly. Uh, within, retail, within the retailer that we kind of know a little bit, you do see a slightly more con, you know, conventional approach to this. Um, you know, Wegmans is always a re great retailer to look at for anybody that will just have a grown-up conversation with shoppers about things. So, you know, do, do, how many people know what full-spectrum hemp is? I don't know, but here's the great thing. Wegmans is like, we're going we're gonna to teach to the back of the room, to use the, uh, the classic phrase. We're going to engage the people that are engaged in the category and know that that engagement is a pyramid and a platform we can build on um, and start to really bring it out that way. You know, you sort of got alternative cares here through CVS trying to take a, what I would call sort of a more middle-of-the-road middle approach. And then you've got DSW. It's like, well, you're here spending money. You might as well buy this too. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, the, the greatest therapeutic solution of all time. So, uh, so, uh, yeah, retail therapy is a time-honored tradition, and uh, DSW leaning right in. So, just to look at some of the executions. Look, when we look at kind of shelves first, and then we'll go to digital. When we start to think about the way that shelf care really works and the way that stores are going to work, we have a really simple framework called PRESS that we use to try to understand what the future of retail stores might look like. And PRESS is an acronym for the, anybody that knows me. You've probably already guessed that. Um, and stands for, uh, stands for five things. Partnership, redistribution, experience, service, and space. 
So what do we mean by this? Well, from a partnership point of view, look, Walgreens right now is increasingly starting to think through what the role of its space is. What Walgreens has is they have more traffic than ability to convert that traffic at, at its simplest form. This is not a knock on Walgreens. They have just built a retail store in the highest traffic locations in the world and just right now haven't quite sorted through the proposition to be able to take that traffic and monetize it. But other people have an idea how to, on how to monetize that. So the Fed, whether it's the FedEx partnership, whether it's starting to engage in their minority investment in Birchbox to start to bring Birchbox to life in some of their stores, you know, whether that's their healthcare clinics through partnerships, or most obviously and recently, the partnership with Kroger to turn over the food section of a Walgreens store to Kroger on the assumption it's like, look, well, you guys are good at selling food. We're good at having space lots of people drive by. Let's work together and figure out how to do that, right? So the other example of this, by the way, from a partnership point of view is Kohl's, who will partner with literally anybody. So, uh, so if you have an idea, go to Kohl's and they will give you space. So, um, so, um, but no, I mean, Kohl's has done some interesting stuff. They've bolted Aldi's into some of their stores where they've been un with underperforming space. They've got 10 stores that are now basically cohabiting with Planet Fitness, where there's a, there's a seamless wall between the two, so you can go buy your yoga pants and then go actually do yoga. Um, a very compelling idea. And, and you look at that, and you start to look at how the retailer that's actually really started to drill down on this is Walmart. And thank you, thank you, thank you to Janet Carter-Smith, who went and took these pictures for us. Um, so, uh, so, uh, cause the, the new Walmart, uh, you know, the new Walmart health store in Dallas, Georgia, uh, just opened recently. And you can see here how Walmart's even starting to look at this partnership a little bit more detailed. Uh, home healthcare and hospice services, uh, with a person to help you navigate that. Um, you've got sort of, a. You know, the only product in the whole store is Nutrisystem, which is kind of cool. Uh, so just as a way to look at that. And then you've got the, the fitness center inside to the left, Zumba, Pilates, yoga, Latin dance classes. And someday, somewhere, you're going to be talking to somebody at a party, and you're going to watch them bust out their Latin moves, and you're gonna t they're going to tell you they learned them at Walmart, and it's going to be a wonderful moment for everybody. So, uh, so uh, but look, I mean, you know, I, we've, been, we've been joking with Walmart about this for years, but a more what I would call democratic version of SoulCycle would make an enormous amount of sense for Walmart, right? Like if you just had something that was less expensive and less kind of New York-y, for lack of a better term, or California-y, and just rolled that through middle America in 15,000 square feet of a Walmart store, this is actually an idea that can really work. And I think if you look at large stores in particular and how they're going to reconfigure their space, a lot of space reconfiguration is going to be aimed at these types of partnerships where I can bring people into the store for a whole host of different reasons. Um, I saw recent, as recently as, uh, you know, in healthcare is going to be a big chunk of that, but I saw as recently, I think it's last week actually was the headlines that one of the mega churches is actually looking to expanding into a mall, right? Which makes sense. If you're going to get a bunch of people together on Sunday, why not put it in a mall? It's the, it's the most logical co-location in the history of the world. So, um, so um, anyway, so you've got some interesting stuff there, and this just gives you a feel for how that, how that space actually sits within the confines of sort of an ordinary Walmart store. We would expect Walmart, in particular, to become a massive part of the American healthcare system. It's the safest prediction in the world. You want to know why? Because they already are. You know, Walmart is the single largest insurer outside of the government of people in the United States. They're the third largest distributor of prescriptions. They're the largest seller of food. They're the largest seller of exercise equipment. They're the largest seller of OTC medication. They already are a massive participant in the American healthcare system. They just haven't organized it yet. So as Walmart gets organized on this, we would expect to see that become a big part of this. Redistribution is the R. It's basically e-commerce, but P-E-E-S-S -S is an uncomfortable acronym. Uh, so we went with redistribution as a way to think about this. Um, and in essence, you're going to see more and more of the store start to turn into an e-commerce solution point, right? So I'm going to start to use parts of the store as a way to fulfill an e-commerce and target uh, through their shipped partnership and through their own work has done a really nice job of reconfiguring their physical footprint. And this isn't just about the front of store. A lot of the innovations that Target's, have, Target's made to do this have been supply chain centric. So if they go through a Target store today and you're watching somebody restock the shelves and they're restocking them on this vertical thing that's got a whole bunch of totes that are kind of laid out, um, they're doing that to save space in the back room and to organize so that they can replenish much more effectively. So the amount of operational thinking that needs to go into not just the e-commerce side of the equation, but the total store to take the non-selling space and make it more productive so I can turn that into redistribution space, the operational piece of this is going to be a very big part of real valuable e-com strategy. On the experience side, uh, the incentive programs, 
I do think that Kroger's been kind of a leader here, I think, in terms of the opt-in programs that they've been running to get through the HIPAA barrier. Um, basically, you get through the HIPAA barrier when somebody says, yeah, I want to do that. And now, all of a sudden, you've got a really cool platform to talk to people around the variety of healthcare needs that you're helping them solve. Um, you know, so, and Kroger's obviously leaning in a lot on in-store technology as well. You've got this fun little thing called Snap to Save, which is basically what some of the Save-A-Lot franchisees use to encourage people to eat healthier and better. I can give you discounts for that. And then, obviously, you've got um, you know, Walgreens Balance Rewards can start to link to, uh, you know, can link to health apps, can link to devices. And this is going to be, I think, a major area here. The connection point between your wearables, your apps, and your retailer is a really, really big area of work. So if a retailer is working on that and they appear to have you know, resources dedicated to that and smart people on it, even if it's a small, even if it's a small retailer, hi, Brent. Um, so uh, so uh, that's really doing some good thinking here. Um, that's a really good partnership. It's a really good way to try to understand where this interconnected space can actually go. Um, from an experience point of view, nobody does experience better than Sephora. And I just, this has nothing to do with self-care per se, except that it's just kind of cool. Um, but, uh, but on the more emotive side of self-care, everybody's always saying, well, what do we do with our most loyal shoppers? You know, do we give them an even faster checkout? You know, do we give them even greater coupons? Well, what Sephora did in LA was they said, well, that's kind of boring. What we're going to do is we're going to give them an opportunity to spend $200 to come to a party, um, which is the greatest Sephora idea of all time, right? So they built this two-day experience called Sephora in this beautiful mansion in L.A., and uh, instead of their gold, whatever they call their premium shoppers, instead of them having sort of a, uh, you know, super discount day, they spent money, $2,000 for a ticket, things sold out in like 20 minutes, right? And then they just brought everybody in the world, and Chrissy Teigen was there, so it's obviously cool. Um, so, uh, and you've got a whole host of things here, and they just basically created an experiential memorial to Instagram. So here's your opportunity. You can go through, insta yourself, and share with your friends the engagement and the experience that you're having in this type of ecosystem. And just, you know, there are very few really fundamental rules in retail. One of them is, when in doubt, do what Sephora does. Um, that can usually work. So, um, so this is, you know, you know uh, now that the Apple Store has started to run into some hiccups operationally and financially, um, largely based on, although it's coming back now because the iPhone 11 has been a huge hit for Apple, but... But, uh, but that store is really dependent on Apple's technology in order to do that. Sephora, probably, outside of Apple, is the most productive retail ecosystem in the world. So, so if you want to benchmark something, it's not bad. So uh, when you start to think about this type of value, um, you see here very quickly that what shoppers, and this chart, you don't see many massive shifts in U.S. shopper behavior. Most of the shifts are on the edges. But over the last five years, what you have seen, and this goes back a little bit longer, is, and this comes out of our Shopperscape data, is a tremendous shift in what shoppers want from a retail, their, their favorite retail store. Because what they've done is they've said, you know what, I've always wanted to either spend as little as possible or feel like I got a good deal. Those are like the uh, you know, 1A and 1B of American shopper choice, have been for generations. But what's creeping up the list at number three and basically tied with the first two now statistically, I want a stress-free shopping experience. And this is now where self-care and shelf care start to come together in visceral form in the store. If the store can't provide an element of care or an element of emotional intake, that's a big piece of this. And a big chunk of how that works is stress reduction. So when you start to think about experiential marketing at retail, all of a sudden you're hearing the soft music, the yoga style stuff. It's all getting very clean. But you know what the best thing you can do sometimes from an experience point of view is just be in stock. This is the uh, so um, so. This is the most confusing chart in the world. This is a this is what we always call the consultant job security chart. So uh, so no one can understand this chart without me here. So you have to invite me back. Uh, this chart basically just crosses through our data. Things that people find exp uh, important in a shopping experience on the bottom. What they how how well that gets delivered by retail on the top. Basically, in this chart, if you're above the top, if you're in the top left of above that pink line, you're doing well. What's doing well on this chart? Nothing. So in essence, what you've got is that one of the greatest ways that you can deliver a stress-free shopping experience is to simply deliver what you promised. So when people ask you, you know, who's doing the best experiential marketing at retail, I'll often just say Greg Foran at Walmart. OTIF was the best experiential marketing platform ever created because all OTIF did was get rid of this stuff. It's like, look, we're going to stop screwing up. And that becomes incredibly important when you start to look at you know, uh, Amazon, which we'll come back to in a sec. From a services point of view, obviously you've got a bunch of retailers trying to do this. hy V, I think, does this as well as anybody in terms of really bringing, uh, you know, some of that broader-based service proposition to life. Um, you know, and whether that's, um, 
you know, Smile Direct Club at CVS, Walmart with its sort of bundle box of, uh, of wonderful, uh, wonderful Pfizer uh, sort of seasonal care items, uh, Sephora doing what it does from a, you know, from a uh, services point of view. And now the last S is space. And this will get us into the digital space and where we'll wrap up. So when we look at the digital space and you look at self-care when it pops up on, uh, you know, when it pops up on uh, Instagram or uh, self-care when it pops up in the app store, you just see the variety of things that come out when the shopper experiences self-care on the digital shelf. Because the digital shelf isn't bound by category. So it's really important to think when you're thinking about digital marketing in the self-care, shelf-care continuum, that in the digital space, categories don't define self-care. People do. And they're going to define that in a whole host of ways that are quite different. So you've got some disruptor brands coming in here, you know, curated to holistic care across that sick care, uh, yeah, that sick care. So whether it's a, you know, plant protein, chia facts, you know, sort of high-end D to C UTI prevention, all of these kinds of things that you're going to see in the D to C space, these brands can just be adjacent to wherever and whenever they need to be in order to bring their proposition to life. You know, Jill joked about uh, Amazon Prime before, so I don't, I don't have to ask you how many of you are Prime members, because you all are. Remember, that's not statistically signif uh, statistically representative sample of the U.S. Only about 50% of American households are Prime members today. Now, that's not 50% of American people, because a lot of the households that aren't Prime members are, are single-person households, mostly older people. But so more than 50% of the American population is tied into Prime, but only 50% of American households are Prime members. But what this chart shows you, and this is basically uh, an ask of Prime members who have been Prime less than a year, Prime one to two years, Prime three years or more. The easiest way to summarize this chart is that Prime is addictive. And what Prime does over time is it changes the way that you shop Amazon, but it really changes the way you shop everywhere else. There is nothing I can tell you to do today that's more important for a retailer or for a brand than to understand how Prime members intersect with your category's ecosystem, particularly the 20% of Americans who have become Prime members in the last three years. 20% of American households have signed up for Prime in the last 36 months. So that's an enormous segment of the population whose shopping behaviors are in flux. And they're in flux between people, 42% of whom are Prime members for a year, say, I tend to check Amazon first before I shop anywhere else. That goes to 64% by year three. 21% say, I shop at some retail stores less often in year one. That goes to 38% by year three. Basically, all of these things that are really bad news for everybody else double in a 24-month time frame between year one and year three. So making sure that I intersect the Prime member, know where, what their relationship is like to my category, and what their relationship is like to the retailer where they buy the category, so that I understand how to keep them, if I want to, in a limited way out of the Amazon ecosystem. How do I defend against this overwhelming trend? Voice is going to be a big part of this. When you look at shoppers who own a smart speakers, 77% um, will say it, it makes life easier. 63% say it's part of their daily routine. 60% are concerned about privacy um, and Amazon's ability to listen to every conversation you have, which seems unnecessary. Um, so, um, so, but, uh, so you've got some interesting things there. And now, when you've got uh, Amazon Web Services added three HIPAA-eligible machine learning tools to its pipeline of services, here's my basic tip on Amazon. Anything that makes a big headline with Amazon, feel free to ignore. Amazon manages the public news flow as well as any company I've ever seen. I was talking to the senior management of a very large retailer, and they had 14 questions about the Amazon Go store. I said, you want to know what the, the purpose of the Amazon Go store was? They're like, what? It's to get you guys asking me 14 questions about it, because this is a total waste of your time. Um, so, uh, so the amount of shareholder value we've burned through while I talked to you about this format, that is a sandwich shop, um, is not very exciting for anybody. What Amazon does really quietly is the stuff that matters. No one had ever heard of AWS until it took over the world, right? Unless you're in VC money or cloud computing. This kind of quiet stuff that they're doing to tech enable the back end of their business to be able to be a play in healthcare is a much bigger deal than some of the noisier front end stuff that they move. But in the end, just trying to make this patient path to purchase really frictionless, that's the key. The move from what we used to call sick care out to self-care, a more wellness-centric point of view, Amazon is going to use and enable everything it can get its hands on to get data and to link together communication platforms to be able to help the shopper manage wellness in as passive a way as they possibly can. Because when Amazon gets you thinking passively, they win. Amazon's brilliance is not that it's a great experience, but that it's a not terrible one. And we looked at that chart before about how retail continuously disappoints its shoppers 
in terms of the executions of the basics. For the retailers in the room today, if you can't do that right, you are more exposed to Amazon than I can possibly describe. The shopper will replace the friction you create with Amazon's friction-free ecosystem. If I'm gonna create friction, it has to be for positive reasons. Every time the shopper stops what they're doing, if there's not a positive outcome, I put myself at risk to Amazon competition. So to wrap up, we talked a little bit about people and who we're caring for, talked a little bit about care and what they're doing, talked about some fun and emerging trends in account of commerce, which we're gonna hear a lot more about for the rest of the day, um, and then tried to look at some of the specific executions of that. For the first time in recorded history, I finished a minute early. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. Much appreciated. So. <laughs>